Hi everyone, thanks for coming to this talk. This talk will be about uh, self-hosting applications using a nomad cluster. So before I begin, I'd like to have a quick show of hands of how many people here are self-hosting already. And so that, uh, that's nice to see, quite a, a few people. So uh, I'd like to share my journey of how I started self-hosting and now uh, my current setup using a nomad cluster. So I work at Zeroda. I have a blog where I uh, particularly write, write uh, about things that I'm learning or find them interesting. And I'm basically a self-hosted enthusiast. I run a lot of services uh, on my uh, Nomad cluster. So my motivation for self-hosting uh, primarily is to break from, uh, break, uh, to remove my dependency from a lot of big companies. This is also commonly known as uh, de-Google your lives. So there are very uh, there are a lot of scenarios where you can get logged out of uh, these services that you uh, heavily are dependent on. Let's say your primary email services or your uh, photo backups. Uh, these are just a few of the um, services that you rely on uh, on these large companies. The other uh, motivation for me was to have my own uh, backup mechanism for my media content, like primarily photos where I use, uh, these days I use Nextcloud for my uh, photos backups. Uh, then there are uh, some uh, scenarios where uh, a company can just lock you out for uh, very stupid reasons sometimes. Uh, this is one of the tweet that I came across uh, just a few days ago while preparing the slides for this talk. Uh, this guy is, uh, he, he was using Notion. Notion, as you might know, it's a very famous um, tool for writing docs and doing a lot of other uh, much more things more than docs. Uh, but uh, this guy got locked out because he's a Cuban resident. So if you think that uh, there's no possibility that this cannot happen, that is very unlikely. Uh, uh, that's a very uh, false uh, pretense and it can happen anytime. There are many instances where uh, people have been logged out of Google accounts as well. and. Uh, you may know that uh, reaching out to Google support as an individual is a really uh, messy task and it's sometimes uh, impossible as well. Then self-hosting, I believe, is a very great uh, opportunity to contribute to open source. So when you uh, tend to self-host, you may come across certain difficulties while deploying those applications, so you may try to fill those gaps. For example, I was uh, deploying a caddy proxy, but uh, at that time, it didn't come uh, bundled with a uh, caddy uh, DNS uh, renewal plugin for Cloudflare. So I built my own Docker image and uh, if, uh, upstream that. And now that Docker image has quite a lot of users. So I think it's a great way to open source, uh, contribute to open source as well. And then finally, self-hosting is great for learning and experimenting with new tech. You will. Uh, 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 come across uh, many new tools and frameworks that you can uh, directly apply those skills at your work as well. So uh, that's why these are my uh, primary motivation for self-hosting. So this is my uh, my server is a uh, my setup is a fairly uh, simple uh, setup where I have uh, three sets of uh, 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 DigitalOcean droplets uh, with a fairly minimal uh, uh, configuration and. For this software, I use uh, these three tools primarily. Uh, Ansible is used for uh, initial deployment of the server, where initial config configuration of the server, where you need to install certain packages, or let's say you need to add SSH keys, uh, uh, do best practices for SSH, like uh, removing the password and disabling root login. So these are certain hardening uh, of the server that you do th this config. So uh, in order to avoid doing them again and again manually, you tend to write a configuration and then do it uh, in an automated fashion. So Ansible is great for defining a list of uh, things that you want to do on a fresh uh, server or to regularly update a server and then run the Ansible playbook. So I uh, use Ansible for uh, installing other base uh, set of software that I'll need on my server. Terraform, Terraform I use uh, for uh, managing my infra. So Terraform is a great way to achieve uh, a consistency between your desired state and the 
a real world state. So what I mean by that is, let's say uh, you want a server to be up and running and you want to deploy some firewall rules. But tomorrow, let's say you migrate to uh, a new server. Now you need those firewall rules again. So instead of uh, relying on your cloud providers, GUI or other CLI tools, you can uh, write a Terraform script which will uh, let you uh, compose all these uh, dependencies together and uh, it's uh, uh, it will define in a declarative fashion. So even if you destroy and start from scratch, you will uh, get all of these uh, things uh, up and running in no time after uh, just you run this Terraform script. And I use Terraform for managing my DNS records as well. So now we come to the final piece of the uh, software in my stack, which is this what which is what this talk is about, uh, Nomad. So for people who are um, unfamiliar with Nomad, it's a software by HashiCorp, uh, and it's a workload uh, orchestrator. So uh, what I mean by that is it's basically a lightweight and a much, much simpler alternative to Kubernetes, where you, uh, uh, where Nomad takes the scheduling and uh, operating decisions for running your applications. It doesn't do a lot of things that Kubernetes does, and it relies on other toolings uh, provided by HashiCorp ecosystem for, to do that, to uh, fill those holes in. But uh, if all you want is uh, basic uh, deployment of your workloads, then I think uh, Nomad is a great fit for that. The Another cool part about Nomad is that uh, you can not just run Docker containers, which is, I think, what Kubernetes supports, but you can run uh, pretty much any application in any uh, way you want. So you can run a binary directly, and Nomad will uh, unzip the binary, execute it directly on the host. Uh, you can run a Java task. So uh, Nomad has a Java uh, task driver, and Nomad has uh, Windows support as well. So if you uh, have a very uh, specific requirement of running an app not as a Docker container, then Nomad is a great fit for that. So how I reached to Nomad uh, in my self-hosted setup, so I was uh, using a Kubernetes at work, and uh, so because of the familiar familiarity at uh, work, so I wanted to have similar setup at my home as well. So instead of Kubernetes, I tried out with a simpler alternative, the K3S. K3S is a minimal lightweight uh, Kubernetes distribution, and uh, for uh, the longest time, I think one or 1.5 years, I was uh, just using K3S for my uh, self-hosted stack. But then things started to get unmaintainable and I uh, lost patience, basically debugging all those issues that come when you are running uh, too many like complicated uh, things which are, uh, which these uh, stuff are not required by my applications, but to support K3S and other uh, tooling around it. So that's when I lost my interest in uh, having uh, Kubernetes in my as part of my uh, self-hosted stack, and I started looking out alternatives. So coincidentally, at that time, we were evaluating Nomad as well uh, at at part of my work. So. I tried out Nomad, uh, a Hello World example, and I was able to quickly follow the docs and able to set up an application in under a few minutes only. Another great thing about Nomad is that since it's a single binary executable, you get a UI as well embedded in the binary, and it's a, a great way to look at when you uh, are uh, doing some deployments, you can see uh, what all applications have failed or they're running since what time, whatever. So all of this is bundled in in the binary itself. So now that we know what Nomad, the basics of what Nomad is, so Nomad uh, comes in two modes. Uh, it's called a Nomad agent, basically the binary name, and uh, you can run as a server or as a client. So, so if you run as a server, the Nomad server won't deploy your applications directly where the server is running. So it will deploy the application to the client. And client is basically what, talk, what talks to the task drivers. So if you're using a Docker container, it will talk to the Docker daemon, which is running on that host. And whatever specification you have given in the Nomad file that will come in the later slide, uh, Nomad will directly translate those specification to the Docker driver, and it will execute uh, your container uh, on that host. So uh, server will tell uh, which client is free, and client will execute that uh, workload. Uh, it's as simple as that. So I was talking about uh, Nomad integrating with other 
tools so as of now nomad ships with a basic service discovery support where you can uh, discover one service uh, running in a uh, cluster let's say service a wants to talk to service b that is supported by nomad out of the box after nomad 1.3 release which happened like two months back uh, before that you had to rely on console so console is a uh, it's again a program by Hashikov, and there is a thing called console connect which is a, a layer on envoy proxy uh, which lets you connect these services together. But after the release of Nomad 1.3, you basically don't need to uh, run a uh, console agent in your uh, setup to have this basic service discovery support. The other uh, integration that Nomad provides is first class support for fetching uh, any kind of encrypt, uh, encrypted secrets or uh, like uh, if you want to have any kind of sensitive data accessible, you can uh, use that, uh, you can uh, fetch them from Hashikov Vault. And then uh, Hashikov Waypoint is a relatively newer tool, f uh, which is for building and deploying together in a single tool with a single config. So uh, Waypoint can be integrated with Nomad as well. So if you want to quickly uh, try out Nomad, it's uh, as simple as just uh, downloading a binary from nomadproject.io or uh, their GitHub releases. And uh, Nomad agent comes with a dev mode. So what I mean by dev mode is it's basically, so Nomad persists state on disk, but in dev mode, it's uh, it doesn't pers persist, it's in memory. So whenever you start this command, Nomad agent dev, and when you exit, uh, Nomad doesn't have any uh, knowledge of the previous run. So it's great for local testing and it's even great for uh, CI testing where you want to test something, integration test, uh, uh, where you want to uh, run a ephemeral nomad cluster basically. And uh, if you want to configure uh, this nomad agent, uh, you just have to edit uh, like a server uh, config stanza and uh, a client stanza. So nomad uses HCL for it, like Kubernetes, Docker, and most of the, most of the DevOps tooling uh, uses YAML, but uh, YAML also becomes unreadable at one point and it's really messy to write with. HCL, I believe, HCL is Hashikov uh, language, uh, config language, and I believe it's a much more uh, readable language than writing YAML. So that is uh, one thing. So uh, like I was tell, uh, telling about uh, HCL, so uh, uh, to deploy Nomad applications, you need to write a job. So uh, think of job spec as a Docker Compose file where you list out all the dependencies to run an application. So you specify your image name, your uh, volume on points, uh, environment variables, and uh, the network configuration, whatever subnet network you want to attach to. You specify all, the, all of this in Docker Compose.yml. Uh, similarly, you do that in Nomad uh, job spec file. Uh, Nomad. Uh, has a hierarchy where you specify the job at the topmost level and then you can specify multiple groups under the job and then you can specify multiple tasks under one group. So the only uh, important thing to know here is uh, all the tasks will run under the same group will run on the same node. So this I'll uh, clarify what this means in the later slide. Uh, so here's a real world example of deploying Gitty. Gitty is a, uh, let's say, alternative to uh, it's a simple Git hosting uh, solution. Uh, so uh, this is the Nomad job spec file where, where it, it's, uh, it's broken down into multiple slides. So, uh, but the gist of it is you deploy the, uh, you specify the job at the topmost level. You specify some properties of the uh, Nomad cluster like data center. Uh, job type service means uh, you only want to run one particular job. Uh, Nomad also supports uh, batch jobs or system jobs, which means it will deploy one on, at least on one node. Uh, and then you specify other things uh, related to the group, basically count of the uh, instances you need and network or whatever you need. Inside the task speci specification that comes under the group, you specify uh, all these, you'll see all these options are similar to the what the Docker uh, daemon would need. So Nomad will just give these options to the Docker daemon and uh, Docker daemon will take over and uh, it'll uh, spawn the container on the host. And then uh, C groups limits apply here as well. So you can specify that. This is the part I was talking about in my previous slide, uh, uh, the uh, Nomad 1.3 service discovery. So you just specify whatever service you want to be discovered in this particular uh, uh, job. So I want uh, git uh, port, 
which is the SSH ports, uh, so I can clone my repositories. And I want I want the web port to be available, so I specify these two services. And uh, Caddy, which is a uh, proxy which is running again in Nomad, it will be able to discover these two uh, services and it will be able to connect. So that is the point of defining services here. So this is a this is how Nomad uh, UI looks like, where you can see this is a this is one job which is running in that particular namespace. This is the job, uh, how that particular job looks like. Uh, all the details of that job are there. Uh, this is what the task is running, and uh, you can uh, see the logs here, and you can see the CPU memory usage, and how long it's been running for. This is the topology of the uh, server, uh, of the whole uh, cluster, where you can see uh, how many nodes or how many clients are running. This is my local Nomad agent dev, uh, uh, screenshot that I am sharing right now, so you can see basically it's my ho uh, laptop host only. One of the important things that I want to cover in this uh, particular slide is, uh, particular talk is basically networking uh, and the importance of uh, properly networking your application in a self-hosted uh, cluster. So sometimes you may want to expose some services to the whole world, but uh, some services you may want to restrict. This is a very common requirement. So my approach, what I follow is, firstly I use TailScale uh, for uh, forming a mesh network uh, for my devices. So TailScale basically assigns an IP from this particular uh, subnet range, 164.0.0.10. This is a private uh, subnet range, and uh, if you uh, install TailScale on any of your particular device, you'll get one IP from this subnet. So let's. Uh, so I have uh, uh, installed TailScale on all my uh, servers. So now I can even my and if I uh, install this on my laptop or my iPhone, I can access any services which are uh, listening on that particular network uh, on that IP. So what this gives me is that um, this is the TailScale UI where you can see the list of devices that I have connected in my own uh, TailScale session, uh, my laptop, my iPhone. Uh, my server. Uh, so what? How I architect is is basically I run Caddy proxy. I run two instances of Caddy proxy. One is a public proxy, a public facing proxy, uh, which is uh, listening on the di uh, digital oceans floating IP. So that's a public IP which is behind Cloudflare, and anyone uh, can reach that IP. The other is the private IP which only the tail scale sessions that are in my uh, authenticated to my account can reach. That is a private proxy. Uh, and it's only listening on that one one of the IP from that particular subnet that I showed in uh, that what TailScale assigns. So uh, how it looks like in real world is basically if device one wants to talk to a public service, it'll go to the public caddy, and then it'll route to the uh, upstream app whatever it wants to. Let's say the Git Gitty web port. Uh, the device two which wants to listen on a particular private. Uh, which wants to talk to a particular internal service that I am hosting, let's say the Gitty SSH port that I don't want to expose to the whole world, that will go to the uh, uh, private caddy proxy. So that is how the separation of concerns work here. Uh, this is a simple example where my ad guard is not uh, listening on the uh, public IP of the digital ocean, where you can see the DNS address is some address from the tail scale IP, uh, CA, CIDR, uh, but unless I want to exp expose the web service as a public facing service then you can see these are the cloudflare records so uh, so i have a cloudflare proxy in front of my digital ocean floating ip and uh, this is accessible so apart from story uh, apart from uh, networking uh, storage is also one of the important concerns in self hosting where you want to uh, always keep a track of uh, whatever the backups uh, you have in your uh, server and for that, I use RESTIC. RESTIC is a tool which uh, will let you uh, encrypt your data at rest, uh, compress it, and upload to a, upload to anywhere. So it supports upload to uh, cloud providers as well. I use uh, BlackBase uh, B2 st object storage because simply because it's uh, I think the cheapest available around. And uh, how I do it is I mount all my uh, volume on points, whatever database instances I'm running inside a particular folder and then I just run a restrict as a cron job inside Nomad itself as a periodic job. Once a day backup, uh, it simply uh, uh, it takes a, comp a compressed a snapshot and uploads to uh, B2. 
these are the services that I'm currently running. If anyone wants to take any ideas or inspiration, so AdGuard uh, is basically a ad blocking DNS service. It's similar to Pyhole only. Uh, you can use either of them. Both are equivalently good. Gitty uh, is what we discussed. J Joplin Sync Server is basically one of the note taking app I use. Uh, Miniflux is one RSS reader. Plausible is for website analytics, just like Google Analytics, but uh, in a much more uh, non uh, what do you call creepy way. Uh, Grafana, Grafana and uh, Prometheus for uh, monitoring uh, these services and because I primarily do infra stuff at home, uh, at work, so I tend to deploy these things at my uh, personal stack as well. Uh, Nextcloud for uh, documents or photo, uh, photos backups. And then uh, this is one service, Doggo, which is a DNS lookup tool that I've written. So there's a web UI for that as well. So uh, that's all I'm running. For the monitoring part, uh, basically I'm uh, running an agent to monitor the uh, connectivity, uptime connectivity of my ISP and uh, the response time. And I can basically see, uh, gather data over time of how my ISP uh, actual connectivity is. Uh, one last thing that I want to cover before concluding this talk is uh, uh, security. So I think uh, a lot of uh, security issues can be solved if you follow basic uh, principle of uh, uh, least uh, 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 sorry privilege. Uh, I'm forgetting the word. Sorry. But what I mean is uh, basically don't listen on 000 blindly if you don't have firewall rules. Uh, always try to listen on, uh, don't attach things to public IP if you don't really want them on the internet. That's, uh, if you just do that, you're basically covered 90% uh, because backdoor entries are re very sophisticated attacks and they, they uh, normally you don't have to worry if you uh, have a good SSH hardening on the server. And uh, if you uh, have a habit of using a VPN, then it's better to uh, use that over just uh, uh, you know uh, exposing those IPs and then directly connecting to those public IPs on your server. And then any kind of admin interfaces that you are hosting, let's say Nextcloud has, AdGuard has, any kind of thing, even if you have uh, any kind of basic username, password, or proxy, or any kind of basic authentication in Caddy, Nginx, wherever, that is good enough. And periodic updates to your app and OS releases, they also help a lot in containing uh, any kind of, sec in mitigating uh, many security issues. So what I want you all to take away from this talk is basically, uh, if you are interested about self-hosting, for people who are curious about self-hosting, but you are overwhelmed about a lot of uh, the choices out there, you can pinkly, uh, simply pick up a, uh, whatever the easiest possible app that you find and then try to host it. And b basically, uh, you don't have to run Nomad or whatever. Whatever uh, you uh, find the most simplest way, uh, you do that. For me, Nomad was basically whatever I was doing at work. So it felt familiar and uh, it made much more uh, sense than running Kubernetes for me. So see, these are the, some of the resources that you can uh, uh, follow. Uh, there's a Mon School uh, self-hosting course. Uh, there's a, a Reddit R self-hosted uh, community. It's an active community of self-hosted uh, uh, people who are uh, uh, who are wanted to uh, inter interested in uh, self-hosting applications. And there's a GitHub repo for uh, hosting uh, uh, for examples of uh, self-hosted applications. And then uh, for Nomad, I think official uh, docs are really the best. So thanks a lot, everyone. And if any questions. Uh, any questions? Uh, hi, Karan. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, I loved your talk. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, one of the questions was, you uh, in your Nomad example, you used Docker as the driver. Hmm. Say if I'm running a binary directly, what part of Nomad or w what 
takes care of the C group interaction with the host. Because in case of Docker, Docker daemon is there. Yeah. So, uh, if so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you see the line number two, driver equal to Docker. Yeah. If you uh, change that to driver equal to exec, so Nomad uses this concept of ch root. And ch root understands uh, C group uh, limits, so you can specify them. Uh, so, ch root is basically, you'll get a isolated environment without any Docker runtime, and you can specify those resource limits. It'll, it'll work. Got it. And the other question is, uh, because like you know, in the real world, since you've already invested a lot of time on monitoring and everything, uh, have you estimated the costs roughly? Say if I want to leave all the big tech software and come to uh, self-hosting completely, you might have estimated a cost also. So just uh, wanted to know that. So I've never really used any uh, SaaS products for monitoring like Datadog, New Relic. I mean, uh, there are multiple other tools because I think uh, Grafana Prometheus is a stack that I'm most familiar with. Even at work, we use that. So I've ne never really compared, but I do believe that those other solutions are really expensive. First of all, you have to uh, have some kind of data retention on it, and then that's how they bill for the number of metrics you produce. So as in, mo as in when you add more services, more nodes, you'll get charged more. So I think that's a uh, really terrible billing model if you are... Uh, especially when you're self-hosting. So I think uh, I don't have any concrete numbers on the cost or anything, but I, I, I think uh, self-hosting Grafana Prometheus is fairly straightforward, so. Uh, I, I didn't mean it on uh, hmm. Grafana Prometheus. What okay. I meant is say, uh, take an example of Google Photos. Okay. So okay. say if you have snapshots yeah. as you uh, showed yeah. in your slides, how much does the rough estimation come to including the server cost and the storage? So I think, so since I'm not uh, just using my server for uh, photos, but I'm using for multiple, running multiple other services. So I think it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but Google Photos, even though it's cheaper, but that's like, I think it's co cost 120 bucks a month or something. I'm not sure, but uh, even if it's relatively cheaper and affordable, that is not my m primary motivation. I don't just want to depend on Google having access to a single point of failure, basically. I don't want that. Makes sense, makes sense. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, so, just a uh, couple of questions. Like, one is, uh, have you ever had like any issues with uh, uptime or like reliability for you know your uh, services? So, these are primarily non-critical services. So, yeah, I have had instances where uh, service has went down. Like, I was hosting Shinet, which is an alternative of Plausible, and one of my blog related to Nomad hit Hacker News. The blog was static website, but uh, the website counter was uh, backed by a uh, Postgres database, and that crashed actually uh, because uh, too many hits came, and it was a uh, Python app. I had I hadn't given a lot of resources to it, so it crashed basically. So I had to recover it manually, but I believe it's not critical at all for me, so I don't uh, uh, give much care about up having 99.99% uptime in my self-hosted stack. Got it. Uh, yeah, so uh, the other thing is like on the note that you mentioned about security, right? Um, so when you're sort of getting started, like at what point like do you feel like, you know, you get like comfortable with this? Like do you recommend just starting out, you know, deploy something and it's okay, like you'll pick that up as you go and just make sure that yeah. there is I mean, nothing uh, critical on that? I think that that is the way to understand this honestly because I think uh, last, in, tw in 2020, I was deploying something on Hetzner. And it, back then, Hetzner didn't have concept of firewall rules. In uh, So Hetzner dedicated servers have firewall rules, but Hetzner only relied on UFW. But uh, if anyone is following a Docker uh, GitHub thread, it's there since 2018 or 2017. Docker doesn't uh, respect UFW rules. So whatever I had UFW like uh, protecting my uh, configurations, that was never working on that Hetzner server. But off late, uh, Hetzner also so got support for firewall rules. But I, I guess this is how I just accidentally discovered that all my services are open out there on the internet. Uh, that, that's where I. So, but, but I guess that's how you figure it out. You make mistakes, and then I mean, unless you have done a drop DB on production database, can you call yourself an engineer? Hello. Hey. Um, so since you were uh, in the last slide, you were motivating us to start off uh, with simple self-hosting. Um, so one of the things that uh, has always stopped me from self-hosting is because I uh, feel that there has to be a always all on computer to yeah. start self-hosting. 
So uh, how do you recommend that? Like, uh, should I uh, just uh, you uh, repurpose one of my old laptops to run continuously throughout the day? So the or easiest way is you uh, get a five dollar, six dollar uh, droplet. I, I, even Hetzner has a very cheaper option. The other way is you get a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi have become expensive off late, but if you get manage to uh, uh, get hold of one of them. then you can basically if you have a, a reliable power supply at your home i mean raspberry pi is also great i am not sure if nemo is here oh hey so he is running his own home server uh, i think on his nas so uh, that's also another alternative if you want to run without a cloud provider so why don't you talk about your luminous toilet cluster so he has like a five Raspberry Pi toilet cluster, we call it. <laughs> okay, oh, one last question, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, I wanted to ask that: uh, Do we have any cost benefit if the traffic is really high on self-hosting rather than going on cloud or other? I mean, providers? I'm not really that famous, so I never had any instances <laughs> where any of my services got any uh, traffic. And primarily, most of my services are private only, so it's for my own personal use. Yeah, but like, uh, if you could say something with your experience that however how much you have invested, and if you start getting some traffic, so at what speed the cost will rise? Like, if you no, could say um, something on that. So, so I have a uh, the Docker dot Mr. Karan dot Dev that I was showing. It's a DNS lookup tool. It's basically behind Cloudflare. It's most of the content is cached. Uh, API requests uh, are there and. I mean, I don't really think there is any financial burden or cost related to that. Like, if it scales that much, then I'll probably think about it. But even at 100k, 200k request, Cloudflare will probably cash 50, 60 percent of it easily. So, and Cloudflare is free. So, I mean, I don't think it's a concern at all. At least at my scale, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.